I, I agree that tech companies are are trying to uh, hijack our attention, but I will say it's not just tech companies. There's there's so many other things that are built into our culture and society that affect our attention. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Parton, and you are listening to the Feedback Loop on Singularity Radio. This week, our guest is Dr. Gloria Mark, who is the Chancellor Professor of Informatics at UC Irvine. In addition to having a PhD in psychology and acting as a visiting senior researcher at Microsoft since 2012, Gloria has recently authored the book Attention Span, a groundbreaking way to restore balance, happiness, and productivity, which will be released on January 10th, 2023. As you might expect in this conversation, we therefore explore many different facets of attention, including but certainly not limited to how our attention span is decreasing, how technology is shaping our attentional habits, the consequences of a struggling attentional capacity, and many different solutions that we might consider to take back control of our attention. And so now I'll hold no more of your attention with this introduction. So everyone, please welcome to the feedback loop, Dr. Gloria Mark. Well, as I mentioned before, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you specifically was I personally like to read a lot of books on uh, technology's relationship with the human experience, with the human condition. And I continually came across your name in multiple books uh, and felt like I needed to look deeper. And you, conveniently enough, have a book coming out called Attention Span, Finding Focus and Fighting Distraction. And I'd love to know a little bit about the background that prepared you for that book and what motivated you to write it. Yeah. So actually, you know, I was motivated out of my own personal experience, as opposed to being motivated, motivated by some, uh, you know, intellectual concern that I had from reading literature. Um, I, I used to work in Germany. And I worked at a research institute, which at that time was called the GMD, German National Research uh institute for information technology and now merged with fraunhofer which people might be more familiar with and at the time uh as a researcher i i viewed it as a life of luxury i could just focus on a research project um and uh what was also very unique uh, was that in Germany, the main meal of the day is called Mittagessen, which is the main meal. It's a nice, long, hot lunch. And my colleagues and I, every day, would go and have this nice, long, hot lunch and then take a 20-minute walk around the campus. It was called a Rund in German. Then I started as an academic in the U.S. in 2000. This is when the digital age was really taking off. And all of a sudden I'm an academic and I'm working on multiple projects and writing grants and mentoring students, teaching classes, sitting on committees. And I just found my attention being, it, it was like whiplash. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to take care of so many different things. And my lunchtime practice changed radically. So all of a sudden between classes, I would run to buy lunch, take out, race back to my office. I'd walk down this long corridor and I'd look in at all the open offices of my colleagues and see everyone sitting behind their computers eating lunch. I would you know, slide into my seat and there I was in back of my computer doing exactly the same thing. And I noticed that I was getting more and more glued mm. to my computer. And at the same time, I was having a harder time focusing on any particular screen on that computer. And so I began to talk to other people and other people were reporting similar kinds of experiences. And so then the scientist in me kicked in 
And I thought, you know, maybe I should study this empirically to see to what extent are people having trouble focusing? You know, is is this a real phenomenon? And that's what, you know, kickstarted my my journey in studying uh, yeah. attention spans. And and from all of that empirical work and, and the recent research that you've done for the book, what are some of the like key things that you realized that made you think, okay, this is a real problem. This, there's something going on here worth talking about. What, what was that thing that you noticed? Yeah. So the, the first thing was that we, we measured empirically how long people's attention was on any particular screen. Mm. And we did this in people's real world work environments and life environments. So you know, usually, as you know, in psychology, you bring people into a laboratory, but we actually went into people's real world environments. And the thing that really struck me and surprised me was how the first time that we were able to uh, measure attention spans empirically was 2004. And we found that people spent two and a half minutes on any screen before switching. At that time, we were astounded. Mm. And we found that people switched any activity in the workplace every three minutes. Uh, we, we would, it was very, it seemed so primitive at the time, but we would take stopwatches and we would shadow people and we would measure every single activity they did when they switched their screens, we would use a stopwatch. And I found over the years that our attention spans have been shrinking. Mm. And in the most recent years, I would say in the last five years, uh, and it's not just my work, other people also have been tracking attention spans, seems to have reached an average of about 47 seconds on any screen before switching. That's the average. The, the median is 40 seconds. And so when you think about it with a median, half the time people's attention is shorter mm -hmm. than 40 seconds. Uh, so attention spans are shrinking, uh, have been over the last two decades. And this, is, this struck me as uh, just surprising. Mm -hmm. And that set off a whole research trajectory for me to try to figure out is is this healthy yeah. are people being stressed what is it about the use of our devices that makes it so hard for us to focus yeah it may feel like a obvious question but i'm going to ask it anyway but is, what is the problem with the shrinking attention span because i think you know a lot of people i talk to and some people who would be, I guess, antagonistic to your viewpoint would argue, yeah, well, everyone said, you know, the, the Greeks said that when people stopped memorizing things and started writing things down. And when we started getting newspapers and books, and then when we started getting, you know, TVs and radios, everyone's always said, we're losing our attention, and it's going to be a problem, but we've been fine. But what, what would you say is the problem with this attention span being reduced so drastically down to 40 seconds? Uh, and technology's role in that. Yeah. So when you when you open up the mind's black box, what here's here's a metaphor for what's happening. Think of it as people having an internal whiteboard that represents the task they're doing. And every time you switch content on your screen or you switch topics, think of it as erasing that internal whiteboard and rewriting on it. And when you switch rapidly, you know, imagine erasing, rewriting, erasing, rewriting. Your, your mind has to process different content very quickly. I agree with you, you know, historically, yes, people have switched their attention, but the digital age has accelerated this switch with, with all the content that's being offered to us. Um, and you know, maybe we can talk a little bit more about all the other forces that exist in society that also uh, spur us on to switch our attention. Yeah, definitely. We'd love to get into that uh, momentarily. Uh, and can you say 
more about that in regards to the maybe the impacts because I know from your book and in, in your research a lot of the times all of this multitasking that we're doing and 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 this quick attention switching that we think makes us really productive is not actually improving our productivity in any way shape or form that's right we 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 think we're doing more when mm -hmm. we multitask but the the research shows that we're actually doing less mm -hmm. and so there have been a number of studies that have been done in the laboratory uh, examining what happens when people multitask. So first of all, performance uh, suffers. So that's that's a very common finding, very consistent. Number two, uh, stress increases. So blood pressure has been shown to rise. The, um, the secretion of the stress hormone, uh, the cortisol, increases. And then from a subjective uh, perspective, people consistently report feeling stressed, burnt out, exhausted when they multitask. You know, when you go back and think about, you know, the idea of switching these, uh, these internal whiteboards, you can also think that people have this limited capacity for attentional resources. And, you know, we, we start off the day, if, if you're lucky to have a good night's sleep, uh, you start off the day refreshed, and then slowly these resources deplete. They deplete for a lot of reasons, but when you multitask, you know, that really mm -hmm. uh, depletes them quite fast, especially when you think about keeping up with uh, uh, the content that you're trying to process. There's content you just looked at that interferes with, with what you're doing right now. There's a, there's a lot going on uh, behind the scenes that, that leads to stress and poor performance. Yeah, and I, when I think of kind of the opposite of that, maybe multitasking, fragmented form of thinking, I think of flow. Now, the flow we can get into flow state. You can maybe mention a little bit more about what flow is for those who might not be familiar. But what I found really interesting about your work is you point out that it's a myth that we should seek flow in our technical, in our digital interactions, that that's actually not maybe realistic, especially in like the knowledge domain. So could you talk a bit about flow and, and why that myth exists? Yeah. So, so flow, this is the, the concept that was um, described by um, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. Uh, it's it's a beautiful concept. It's the idea that uh, there are some things that we can be so immersed in, and we're we're so involved in that we we lose touch with the passage of time. And it's when we're in our it's an optimal state for us. We can be highly creative. Um, you know, we, you, that's where the term flow, you feel like you're just in the, the flow. Um, I should mention before I became a scientist, I actually started out as an artist. Mm -hmm. So I have a degree in fine arts and I used to experience flow quite a bit, you know, especially if I worked through the night, I could get into flow and it's not hard for people who work in the arts a musician, uh, someone who maybe does carving, uh, you know, someone who has a hobby that they're really engrossed in. It's it's not hard for them to achieve flow. But in our knowledge work, day-to-day uh, -to -day knowledge work, we find that because of the nature of our work, it's quite rare for people to experience flow. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be focused but not necessarily in a flow state. And when you're focused, you know, you have to use sustained attention. Sometimes you have to put in effort to, to keep that um, attention uh, sustained. Um, but it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a flow state. Now, people who do complex coding mm. can, can get into flow. They've reported that someone who plays video games on the computer could get into flow. But for the vast majority, majority of us who, you know, we, we 
write reports, we do calculations on spreadsheets, we answer email, um, and you might do creative things. Like I might write a, a book chapter and find it creative, but it's not flow, hmm. right? I'm using focused attention and that's different. Do you think that that is particularly alarming maybe? The fact that so many people in the modern you know, world of work aren't accessing flow? Is that maybe a, a, a negative thing? Well, I would say it's it's not necessarily negative if you can find another outlet mm. through which you can experience flow. So I know things that I can do to experience flow, right? If I, I don't do so much art these days, but I know if I did art, I could get myself in flow or dancing could get me into flow. <laughs> But I, I am very realistic, and I know that if I have to write and do hard work that involves a lot of uh, thinking, um, probably I'm not going to get into flow. And you know, it's we we've looked at hundreds of people in the workplace, and except for the complex coding and video game uh, scenarios that I talked about. It's pretty rare for people to um, to report getting yeah. it to flow. Sometimes I, I will say sometimes at a meeting, mm. if you're in a creative brainstorming session with other people, you might feel like you're in flow. Yeah, like a group flow from the dynamics. Yeah. H have you looked into at all the long term impacts of, of being in flow more often or being distracted? And I guess what I'm alluding to here is if we are reducing our attention span down to 40 seconds and we're doing this constant kind of jerky attention, I think you call it kinetic attention. Yeah. Um, are we wiring our brain to operate in that same jerky kinetic way when we're not in front of a screen? Is our default changing to, to a, changing to become that, that way as well? Yeah, I, I think, I think we can expect that this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, I mean, there, there are things, activities we do outside of our computers and phones where people do have short attention spans. Uh, and for example, in you know the broader media industry, film and TV, screenshots are quite short. They switch every four seconds on average. And when we're exposed to these kinds of short content switches, right? Our, our attention is changing. We're processing content differently. But um, it, it, it has to affect us because mm -hmm. we spend so many hours a day in front of our computers and phones, right? It, it would be uh, hard, hard to believe that we're not affected, that we're not conditioned to have short attention spans on, on other things as well. Yeah. And, and in the broader context, you mentioned before, I'd like to go back to some of the other things that kind of push us into this uh, attentional issue, things like culture, stress, environment. Um, maybe let's just start with stress, because I think that's such a pertinent one. What are some of the ways that stress impacts our relationship with our attention and technology for that matter? Yeah. So it's it's really interesting. It's um, It's cyclic. So we can do things on our devices that increase stress, such as multitasking, uh, experiencing interruptions. And it turns out that we're just about as likely to interrupt ourselves as we are to be interrupted from some external stimulus like phone call or notification. And so uh, when stress when stress increases, right, as a result of things we're doing on our devices, stress in turn makes it harder to focus. Mm. Because um, let's take the case of neuroticism, which is a personality trait. And um, roughly, you know, half the population would be considered to be neurotic, because that's the way, if, if you know psychology, that's the way personality tests are constructed so that half the people would score above uh, the median. 
what do neurotics do? They tend to replay events over and over in their minds. I, I do. I, I know that I do. You know, you, you might have done something or had a conversation and you keep replaying that in your mind. Uh, that gets you stressed. Mm -hmm. And there could be all kinds of triggers that lead you to replay these scenarios. Even if you're not neurotic, there's all kinds of triggers we experience when we're on our devices. Um, there could be unfinished tasks that become a trigger that cause stress. Uh, you know, I, I talked about interruptions. Uh, it, there could be some negative emotional experience that uh, you have, say, through email or Slack or someone is demanding work of you. Uh, this leads to stress. And then in turn, it affects your ability to concentrate and focus. So going back to what I initially said, it's cyclic. Mm -hmm. Right. There's and you can almost think of it as spiraling downhill throughout the day as you get more stressed, makes it harder to focus. Your attentional resources yeah. are depleting. And then it's it's really hard to have have you looked to, into the um attentional restoration theory at all by Kaplan and Kaplan? Are you familiar with their work? No, it, it just makes me think of, of what you're talking about. Basically, they, they've done a lot of the work on how nature kind of rejuvenates your attentional resources, how, you know, if you're doing a sustained attention task and then you take a walk, you know, yes. through a park or something and come back to yes. it, you'll be better than if you walk through a city. It's just making me think, I, I was just one, curious if you had explored that at all, because it makes me think that as we navigate our urban environments with cars and people everywhere and all the sharp edges and you know dearth of, of green space that our brains are constantly trying to inhibit all these different stimuli that are coming at, at us and we're draining those attentional resources that you talked about yeah actually i i do know that work that mm. that work is uh done by other researchers where they found a, a mere 20 minute walk in nature can can restore people's uh, resources. Um, I, I did a study um, at Microsoft Research uh, with Sabdul Abdullah, who also showed that a 20 minute walk in nature can result in people being uh, significantly more creative. Mm. So there, there are certainly benefits to that. Now, whether being in nature versus being in a city I, I don't know. Um, you know, my sense is that it's going to be beneficial to take a walk uh, anywhere, right? Yeah. To get yourself away from the computer will uh, replenish you. Now, you know, I suppose it depends on what the urban environment is mm -hmm. like, if there's a lot of noise, uh, if you're frustrated because you can't cross the street from traffic. I mean, those things can uh, impact your your ability to replenish for sure. Yeah. Well, let's maybe jump to a different environment, the abstract environment. What about culture? How do you think that maybe culture in general is impacting our, our relationship? And I guess this could be anything from the economic expectation that you're going to work nine to five, you know, or or some impetus or expectation that you're going to answer your phone within 20 minutes of getting a text, you know, and that's just the expectation as, as a social contract. Can you talk a little bit about these kind of things? Yeah, uh, I think that um, we have our, our culture has evolved, especially in the digital age, uh, where we have expectations that we will be very productive, whatever productivity refers to. Um, and so we push ourselves. Mm. You know, there's this expectation that computers and phones have extended our capabilities to be productive. And so therefore, more is expected of us. Managers expect more of employees. And so they delegate more work. Um, yet, delegating more work and sending more messages is actually making us less productive because we have to 
deal with those messages. So there is most certainly a culture of trying to squeeze out every last productive juice out of us. And we should schedule our time down to the minute so we can try to do as much as possible in as short a period of time. And of course, because we have devices, we should be able to do that. Most certainly there is. There is you, you talked about the, the social influence. Mm -hmm. There is a very, very strong social influence that also um, compels us to multitask in the sense that people want to accumulate social capital. And social capital is the trading of, of favors, of resources. So I'm going to answer your email because I expect someday you're going to answer mine. And uh, I'm going to do you a favor because at some point I would expect you'll do one for me. And the whole internet is a marketplace of social capital. Social capital is traded all the time. And so we answer email, we jump to answer email and Slack uh, and even social media because we want to build up our social capital resources. So that's, that's one aspect. Uh, another thing is power. Mm. We're very much influenced by power. We respond to messages from people who are more powerful than us. Uh, people on social media want to accumulate power and maintain power. You do this through followers. And so power is also another driver of our attention. And of course, there's, there's social influence. People, there's identity. People want to maintain identities, whether it's a work identity or other kind of social identity on the internet. And so they spend a lot of time and spend a lot of uh, effort into yeah. maintaining identity. You, you, you talk about attention traps, and I believe one of the attention traps that you talk about is identity. Um, and I'd love to know what you think about how attention comes into that. Is it, is it just the fact that we want so deeply to craft our persona in this digital space that we end up coming back to that digital space constantly, making it salient to our attention so that we can be mindful of how we're shaping it? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's it's how we present ourselves to the world. And of course, we, we have this huge arena that mm. we're presenting ourselves to. And so we're constantly thinking about how can we refine our identity, right? This is what we want the world to see in us. And so... Um, you know, and of course, it affects some people more than others. Uh, if, for example, if you're an influencer, you're going to be thinking a lot about crafting and uh, maintaining your identity. Um, and so this can, of course, interfere with other things that we're trying to do. Um, but everyone, to some extent, everyone who's using the Internet, almost everyone, is thinking to some extent about the identity that they want to present yeah right yeah how do we i guess i don't want to go too deep into solutions at this point and i i know it's almost if you had solutions you get the nobel prize so i don't expect real answers here but with something that is so salient to us evolutionarily you know the desire to fit in the de desire to belong the desire to have this identity this social validation and status game that we play like you said with power and how we respond to people it seems that the digital landscape is the just streamlined, optimized, optimized space for us to do that in. And so how do we back ourselves out of that space when it is the perfect vehicle to do the thing we're very much wired to do? Yeah, it's, it's, it is a great uh, question. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of things that we can do. And mm -hmm. I, I do talk about that in my book. Um, I mean, one of the things that we can do is what I call practice meta-awareness. Mm. And this refers to the meta-awareness means being aware of what you're doing in the present. There are so many things we do when we're on our devices that are automatic and that are habitual. 
and you know we we will respond to an email notification or we're, we're just driven to go to social media as you point out by our social urgence and social curiosity but if we can uh practice meta awareness we we raise these automatic uh actions to a conscious level we can start questioning ourselves and that's what i do i practice meta awareness when i have an urge to go to social media i'll ask myself what's the reason i want to go there do i need to go there now what's my level of cognitive resources do i need a break mm. is the reason i'm going there to take a break okay if, if that's if that's it that's that's fine but um you can simply become much more aware of what you're doing and it can help you curtail some mm. of these urges it feels like to do that we might need to address that cycle you talked about earlier which is the stress right because i feel like if you're stressed you start to lose access to that mindfulness a little bit right so yes. are like stress practices actually attention practices in a lot of ways i think so i i do think so uh and i think that if you can begin to um understand the things that you're doing when you're online mm -hmm. and especially what are you doing that's making you stressed and of course the the underlying thing is to become aware of your level of cognitive resources. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the book, I, I use this metaphor of thinking of a tank. You have your own personal gas tank of resources and becoming aware of where your level is at. And if the, the problem is that people let themselves get too drained mm -hmm. before they realize, oh my God, I'm so stressed. I need to step away and take a break, but you have to act before you get to that bottom point, mm -hmm. right? Before you're completely drained and you want to be proactive and be thinking about what you're doing and be aware of your resources so that, you know, Hey, it's time for me to pull back. I'm starting to feel a little bit drained. Let me pull back now. Let me replenish. And, and you continually ask yourself, you know, what am I doing? What can I do to make myself to build back up my resources? Now, it, you know, it might seem a little bit hard to do at first, but if you practice it, it becomes very natural. And it's it's become second nature to me when I'm on my devices. Now, I admit, uh, I'm a professional observer of people, mm -hmm. right? That's that's what I do for a living. But I have learned to become a professional observer of myself. So it's about developing an analytical and objective mindset about yourself and about your actions. And if you keep and and the the exercise, if you will, to get you to do that is by asking yourself these questions mm. so if you if you practice mindfulness i know a lot of people practice mindfulness it's about focusing on some physical aspect of yourself you focus on breathing or you focus on sounds or focus on uh your uh, feelings in your body and it gets you to brings you to the present it's a similar idea when you're on your devices it's it's getting your awareness to become much more conscious mm -hmm. so that you can analyze what you're doing and then you can make more intelligent decisions about you know how to use your devices one one thing about that that uh i believe i talked to uh near il about um his he he has this idea um, and I believe, you know, uh, Johan Hari and Stolen Focus kind of criticizes it and says, you know, there's this cruel optimism mentality, which basically says, you know, you can just choose not to do these things. You can have the self-awareness. I'm not saying you're doing this, but, you know, it's kind of this lux luxury of uh, mental awareness to be able to do this. But there's obviously this manipulate manipulative side of things, right? There's this attention economy that hires psychologists who are literally 
pay to figure out how to grab your attention. You know, that th this isn't conspiratorial. We just know this is what happens, right? How do you kind of navigate that desire to manifest your self-awareness against this artillery barrage of PhDs who are there trying to work against you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me say that I think I, I agree that tech companies are are trying to uh, hijack our attention. But I will say it's not just tech companies. No. There's there's so many other things that are built into our culture and society that that affect our attention. So it's tech companies are just one part of it. Yeah. And, you know, I talked about film and TV. There is the design of the internet itself. There's our, our social natures. There's personality. There's uh, uh, emotional influence that things on the internet have for us. There, there's so many other things. But I'm a, a, a big fan of the psychologist uh, Albert Bandura. Mm. who has spent his career studying self-efficacy and how people can develop agency. And he has shown success in so many different areas, for example, stopping smoking. And so I, I am optimistic that people can achieve agency. Uh, it's, it, you know, I if, if we're just completely... Uh, at the mercy of tech giants and you know how they're manipulating our attention um I, you know i would have no faith at all in what we're doing but i i do think that human beings do have the ability to develop agency we're we're not just complete pawns mm -hmm. that you know pe people are intelligent they can change and they can develop agency and there's there are very specific steps you can do. You know, I, I mentioned the meta-awareness is just one step, but there's there's other steps. I'm, you know, I can talk about those as well. Uh, if, you, if you'd like to touch on another one, I mean, yeah, I'd be happy to hear some of the other thoughts that you have if you're open to sharing. Sure. So another another thing you can do is is practice forethought. <laughs> And what that means is that when you take an action, you imagine how it's going to affect you in the future. And that future could be in a few hours or it could be at the end of the day. And so if I'm going to play a mindless game, which, by the way, mindless games are, are not necessarily bad for us. They can help us replenish. Before I start it, I try to envision what my end of the day is like. I want to go to sleep relatively early. And at the same time, there's things I need to finish by the end of the day. So before I pick up that mindless game, I, I imagine what my end of the day will look like. I want to be in bed having a nice sleep. And so that's going to stop me from mm. picking up that game. Uh, there's a, there's another another technique we can practice, which is keeping your goals in mind. Now, goals uh, direct our attention. We pay attention according to what our goals are. If my goal is to write a book chapter or to write a report, that's where I direct my attention to. If my goal is to relieve boredom, then I'm going to go to a new site or social media, right? So goals are really important. It's, it's a very basic part of our attention. And so a lot of what happens is that we let our goals slip. Yeah. And you might start the day writing your goals on a piece of paper, but it's not enough. We have to continually reestate, reaffirm our goals, keep them in our consciousness. Um, and there's different ways you can do it. Sure, you can write them down. You can visualize your goals concretely. Mm. Not, le not keep them abstract, but make them very concrete. So for example, 
I need to finish writing something by the end of the day. And I actually spend a minute or so visually visualizing what that looks like. Mm. And if I can visualize it and make it concrete, it's a lot easier to keep that in mind. Goals are an armor. They're, they're a shield against distractions. Yeah. And anytime you're, you lose sight of your goals, you are just susceptible to having some distraction come and pierce through your attention. Yeah, I don't want to make any broad judgments of society here. But I, I think when you're talking about this of a Gallup poll, I believe I read where it was something like 87% of people have like basically no enthusiasm for the work they do. It's uh, they're either just apathetic or they actively hate the work that they do. Um, and it makes me think that one of the reasons maybe we get into this, I don't want to say addictive necessarily, but we get into this cycle of distraction is maybe just boredom. Like we just have a lot of people not doing things that they enjoy. So can you, can you talk about that at all? Is there something about the beyond just the goal aspect, but the interest, like how interested we are in something, does that affect how deeply we are going to stay engaged with it versus how distracted we'll become? Yes, you, you are exactly right. And uh, in, in my research, we, we discovered that there are different types of attention. Mm -hmm. So the, the common narrative is that there's two states of attention, you're focused or unfocused. And we found that there are different types. Uh, boredom is, is a state of attention. It's when you're, you're not challenged and you're not engaged. Um, rote attention is a kind of attention where you're engaged in something, but you're not at all challenged. You're, you're playing, uh, you're going on social media, you're playing solitaire. And so if you're experiencing rote or bored attention, you are much more susceptible to distractions mm -hmm. because you don't have strong goals that can shield you. Now, you know, with rote attention, you're you're playing Candy Crush. Okay, so you do have a goal. <laughs> and and that might protect you from being distracted by something else if you're really engaged in that. But when you're bored, uh, we have absolutely no defense against distractions. And, and we showed empirically mm. that when people are in this bored state, they're much more likely to be distracted by, by some kind of interruption. Yeah. Maybe go in the other direction here a little bit. Can you talk a bit about maybe ADHD and, and how that has been something that has seemed to be rising drastically over the last few decades? Is that something that you think is related to technology? Or is that maybe just an improvement of diagnostic measures or less stigma in mental health? So I actually was very interested in this question. And so I, I did some digging to look at what the prevalence of ADHD is. And I found uh, the best study I found was a, a, a review that was done in 2021 of 40 studies. And it was conducted with over 107,000 individuals. And it found the prevalence of ADHD among adults to be 4.6%. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then uh, another study that I found to be quite good was that among U.S. children and adolescents ages 2 to 17, there was a, a survey done in 2016 of over 50,000 households that revealed that 8.4% 8 of this age group was diagnosed to have ADHD. Now, of course, you know, the numbers of, if we look at the adults, 4.6%, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's uh, maybe not as alarming as we thought it would be. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know to what extent 4.6% is because of improved diagnoses, uh, greater awareness in the public because of this, but we cannot tie this. We cannot make any kind of causal connection mm -hmm. 
between ADHD and the use of our devices, right? To make any kind of causal connection, we'd have to do a, an empirical study where people were tracked over the years, where we looked at usage of their devices. We cannot make any kind of causal connection or claims. Um, but I will say that the phenomena that we found in our empirical research is that this kind of fast switching of attention, this kinetic attention is found universally among a lot of people, uh, people without ADHD diagnoses. Mm -hmm. And in the studies that we do, you know, we do give surveys to people and we, we can see if people fall in the extreme ends of these surveys to see whether they might, uh, their responses are associated with ADHD diagnoses. Um, and we've rarely found mm. people in our studies. So, um, but, but yet we have found this kind of kinetic attention yeah. behavior. Well, the, I guess for me, and I'm not sure if this is 100% accurate, so I, I'll need to fact check this, but for my understanding with the right or I should say when you have attentional fatigue or let's say the cognitive load becomes too much for too long, I believe when you're, let's say the gas tank is low, that you start to mimic some of the effects of, of ADHD, right? So even though it may not be a clinically diagnosable expression of ADHD, it seems that with enough attentional fatigue, we show ADHD like behavior. Is, yes. is that something you've heard of as well, maybe? Yes. I mean it's 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 what I've seen. Okay. But yeah. but that that's very different than okay. an ADHD diagnosis because people who um you know, I mean it's it's a spectrum and, mm -hmm. and people who uh, don't fall into the extremes, um if they're if they're not fatigued, uh if they're replenished they they can have focus right they're they're not experiencing this kind of uh kinetic type of attention so it's something i think you know any anyone can experience this kind of uh these what you're calling mimicking symptoms of adhd mm -hmm. if you're if you're really just exhausted mentally exhausted but it does not mean you have ADHD because all you need to do is get replenished, right? Get a good night's sleep, take a nice long break, take a walk outside in nature, and you can get back on track. Whereas someone with ADHD, um, they, you know, there are some things they can do, but they can't go back to, or they, they can't achieve this kind of level of focus. Right. That makes sense. <clears throat> well, as we near the end here, I want to kind of get towards towards some of the solutions beyond what you already mentioned, which were fantastic. But I, I'd love to know if you think that there is a top-down uh, policy aspect to this that needs to take place. You mentioned a lot of the bottom-up things, I think, which is the individual's mindfulness. But, you know, like in France, in the book, you mentioned the right to disconnect the law. That I think, if I'm correct, makes it basically illegal for employers to demand that they get a response after business hours. Um, are there things like that that you think need to happen or should happen to kind of change the environment or change the relationship with stress uh, that could help the individual re kind of reclaim some of the their attentional power? Absolutely. So I, I am a big fan of right to disconnect laws. And it, it seems uh, New York City tried to introduce this a few years ago, but, you know, apparently it, it was not successful. But the right to disconnect protects workers. So it they they are they will not experience repercussions for if they do not answer emails or Slack messages after their work hours. So it gives them a chance to um, you know basically replenish. And you know it ties into the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights where people have a right to be able to relax and have leisure time without having uh, to work all the time. I think that at an organizational level, 
organizations can do things. They can, for example, uh, limit email to certain hours of the day. And this can help rewire expectations so that you're not, if you're getting email throughout the entire day, you're, it creates habits to keep checking, right? I talked about social capital. You want to make sure you have collect that social capital so you want to respond fast. But if you know email is only coming first thing in the morning, maybe it's coming after lunch, maybe at the end of the day, it's going to uh, rewire your behavior. You're, you're not going to be checking in between those times. And, you know, if you if you wait till the end of the day to answer email, a lot of problems are already solved, yeah. right? So things that seem so urgent at the moment can, you know, easily resolve themselves by the end of the day. Um, I do not believe that any individual can do this on their own. It's, it's too big of a problem because for any individual to disconnect, you know, there's a lot of uh, talk about, you know, take a detox, you know, uh, unplug. Um, sure, you can do this every so often, but it's not a permanent solution. And because we're, we're too interconnected. Yeah. In this uh, in this social web, and any individual who disconnects penalizes themselves, right? It just hurts the individual to to drop out. You're not you're not tied into work communications. There's family and friends that you're not tied into, and so it's the solution has to be set at an organizational level for work, or even at a societal level. Mm -hmm. in terms of uh, changing our expectations. Yeah. Well, beyond the, the, the those policy type changes, uh, what is your thoughts about things just looking forward more broadly? What are your thoughts around maybe the future of technology and its relationship with attention? Um, I know you have a chapter in the book about the, uh, the future of attention in, in this relationship. I believe you mentioned AI a fair bit in there as well. So as we look forward, are you optimistic about the direction we're going? Are you hopeful about certain technologies? Can you just kind of show us what your lens into the future looks like? I, I am optimistic about the future. So what I see happening is that people will have their own personal agents, which can help them manage the uh, the, um, the all the information that we're we're trying to get, and there have been attempts at developing personal agents, but I I think we can do a lot better. And this is this is a personal agent that would serve as a coach mm. to teach people. I don't see an agent. I don't see offloading all the work onto an agent because then the person themselves doesn't learn how to develop their own agency. And that's what it's all about. It's about developing your own agency to be a stronger person, to be more resilient when you use your devices. And a personal agent can understand your level of cognitive resources. It can learn these. It can understand when it's time for you to take a break and pull back. It can understand, for example, the order in which you should be doing tasks so that you're not exhausting yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because if we're, we're often pushed to do one hard task after another, and, you know, we, we can't do that. We, we need to be able to replenish. So I do see, I do see a role in, in AI working with us, but I also think it's very important for people to own their own data. Right, mm. we we can't let a um, a tech giant own the data for this personal agent. We have to own it ourselves. Yeah, it makes sense because it feels like the more data that people have on us, the easier it is to understand what's salient, and the easier it is to snag our attention against our will. Yeah. Well, on that note, Gloria, I think we're coming to time here, and I want to respect yours, but of course, I want to give you a chance to kind of tell us 
what's coming down the line. Your book, I, I, I'm actually not sure I, I know when the release date is. So if you could maybe tell us that kind of information and where to find it, that would be wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. So the book is called Attention Span. And uh, it's published by Hanover Square Harper Collins. Uh, the release date will be January 10th. And it is available for pre-order at your favorite uh, online bookstore, um, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, whatever, whatever your yeah. favorite place is. Um, the the book covers uh, three major things. Let me just briefly talk about the first is the empirical research that documents how short our attention spans are and that talks about the different kinds of attention that we experience and it it also goes a little bit into the history of psychology as it relates to interruptions and multitasking uh, talking about celebrities like Kurt Lewin and Bluma Zygarnik, if you're familiar with that. The second part of the book talks about all the societal forces that we experience that affect our attention. So you talked about the, the PhDs that are working to you know, find ways to get notifications to target our attention. Uh, yes, targeted algorithms are certainly uh, in, in the book. But I also talk about other societal forces, uh, including the very design of the internet itself, right? Vannevar Bush, had, he was a visionary who designed uh, the Memex, which later became the internet design, so that it could map so well onto how humans organize information in our minds, which is a semantic network. And it's of course it worked beautifully. It worked too well because it just greased the wheels for us to surf the internet. It makes it too easy for us to surf the internet, and we go down rabbit holes. So that's an ex another example of a, a force. Um, and then I I talked about the emotions. Turns out our happiest state of attention is when we're doing this kind of road activity and uh you know mindless things it why do we do it it makes us happy and that's also a pull on our attention um the last uh third of the book talks about the path forward mm. we talked about some of the i talked about some of the solutions here there there are other solutions as well how you can design your day to be very clever so that you can um not over exhaust your um, precious mental resources. And I even uh, question whether people even have free will in the digital age, considering all these forces that are working in concert against our attention. And the answer is, um, it, it's, a, it's a modified yes, we have free will. Uh, and then the, the book ends with uh, future solutions. Wonderful. Well, I got a chance to read it and really enjoyed it, Gloria. So I appreciate you writing it and I appreciate you sharing your uh, attention with us for this hour so we could chat about it. It was my pleasure.